Can anybody give me an example of a cultural competence of a dominant group? Give me another dominant group. Police officers. Right? That would be a dominant group in context of what they do and being what they call leaders, if you will, and protectors of the law. So they live also within their rules and guidelines. And who would be the subordinates? All of us. <laughs> Those who are not law enforcement agents. Now, if police, that's why this education is so powerful. If police become intentional to gain cultural competence, what you see happen in the society right now, I promise you, would get reduced in terms of the behaviors that we're seeing, whether it's African-American, Latino, or even just arrests made on biases and stereotypes. And I think it makes it even more serious when they're already in fear and then they have a lack of cultural confidence. Mm -hmm. I think that part of our culture as a whole, me personal, it's my personal statement, that the fact that this isn't bought in to orientation and education at a level that we're trying to teach at right now to make sure that when I give you the office of a public servant, let me let you understand that that office requires responsibility. And the responsibility is to not just look at life through a subjective lens. That people of different colors, races, ethnicities, just because they are color or race or ethnicity doesn't mean that they're gonna act in a typical behavior that maybe social media may show. And we're all individuals. Unfortunately, that's not something that's done all the time. So I just wanted to make that point. Another group is uh, financial institutions. Financial institutions. Dominant group. Dominant group. <clears throat> because they can, it took me five years before somebody, even the government, were able to let me get an SBA loan. I had to get a lot of predatory loans. That's the truth. For whatever reason. I don't know what it is. Um, but I finally was able to work myself with the government with now grant me some security in a loan type situation. So here, in context here, who is the dominant group when it comes to the relationship between the patient and the staff? The staff. But what makes you dominant? There's a power difference. But what? Huh? Keepers of the system. Keepers of the system. Come on, give me you guys. Give me an example. What makes you kind of the dominant group here? Numbers. Leaders. Huh? Leaders. Leader. Who, who, who's in recovery here? Maybe that's something you've never seen. So we're the prime example of what they could have or become. Right. So how could we be irresponsible as clinicians hmm. when a patient comes in? Because this is really the root of it. Now we get to it. What would make me irresponsible? What could make you irresponsible as a chef? Um, um, my responsibility is to, um, um, no, all right, let me, let me help you. Meaning, what could, all right, if you don't assess the patient when he comes in, knowing that, let's say this patient comes from a different cultural, what type of food you like, race or whatever, and not even ask, hey, you know, you know, I do pretty right. much a, uh, a Latin flavor cuisine, American flavor cuisine. Is there some things that you like that maybe I could bring that that are indigenous, meaning that are common to your culture? Or what are they allergic to? Right. Right. So that would make me culturally competent in context of being an employee at Dedicado to look at the patient, not because I may know how to cook this and cook that, because it ain't about what I know how to cook. Of course, you have to know how to cook, but can I consider that this person may not like these type of meals and on a general basis or whatever. I understand that universally in a system, you can't change everything. But just having some sensitivity to it could also create community with the patient. To say that they really care, they even ask. See, we have a responsibility here for the patient. And then we have a responsibility with each other to try to understand each other. When we pass the buck, which I've seen here, guys, and they'll call your name, but when we pass the buck, what we're invariably doing is connect, telling our peers that we don't really care. That's what we're saying. Yeah. And there's a term called deliberate indifference. Right. Operating as if it don't matter. You know, I, it, it, this brings you to an experience I had, you brought me up on it, is a client came to me for medication. So I don't give out medication. I was in the middle of a note, and I just simply said, I don't do that. It was brought to my attention. How do you think the patient received that, Charles? And see, it was brought to his attention, not that Charles is bad. Right. 
But that would not be the response. What would be the appropriate response? What would be a competent or culturally, let me, let me based see. in this culture? I, I don't normally do that, but let me see how, what I can do to help you. That's it, it's very simple. This isn't something that I normally do, but let me get somebody to help. And there's another, there's a few varieties. There are people that are specifically trained for that. Uh -huh. Let me locate them. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, so, there, there has been times where I said, I don't do that, but the techs do. Mm -hmm. But I can see how that client could have been. And, and not even just that. say just the tech does, it, to, 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 to show total service in this area. I would say this is no job normally for the tech, so let me go get the tech for you. Right. We have to have some sort of some, some, some form of benevolence. I think right. the way you might put it would have probably shut that person down. Then, well, they they, they 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 felt that way because they talked to Doctor Marshall, and that's why he brought to my attention, yeah. I believe. And I don't believe that Charles meant it from a framework of being mean. Right. But that that's this is the power of being sensitive to the culture here. I even think the way I received it was important. And and this becomes another point. And when we talk about trauma-informed care right. environment, that Keep it's working. not it's not what we say or do. It how it's how the client receives it, it. because yeah. we have no control over how they will receive it. So if I'm operating from a trauma-informed position, I'm being mindful. Before Guys, I this is responsible learning, and I'm hoping that you you receive it. Because in the context of us, I'm going to get you, bro. In the context of helping these patients here, they have a culture too, and then they're dealing with this big thing on their shoulder. I'm using it, and I can't stop. I'm feeling hopeless. Are you going to, one of the biggest factors for our friend that just walked downstairs was, was he going to be judged? Did you guys know that? Yeah. He was so scared of being judged. And when I normalized it by telling him me sleeping behind a dumpster at one time in the life, we became buddies real quick. Because he realized that it was no longer. I'm seeing him. He perceived that people were going to judge him. Yeah, he's beginning to feel better here than he was over there for 45 days, based on what he told me. Yeah. So culture has a lot of implications. Remember, you bring yourself to the table, they bring themselves to the table, and then there's that table. This, this system right here. The system that we're in. Okay? Dominant support and culture. The meaning and nature of culture is derived out of the live, lived experiences of this social group. From this comes a complex combination of dominant and subordinate cultures that serve the function of society. Culture, social power, these are dynamics that can move. Language, sanctions, norms, values. What does that mean? We're in American system. What's, a, what's, a, what's the biggest cultural thing with language? We all speak what? Right. Yes. Hey. Sanctions. We all live under what? Laws. laws and rules in this in, in, in the American society, right? Mm -hmm. Norms. What's in what what would what, you know how they always say what would be like an American meal? <laughs> like hamburger. Huh? Norms that we eat that is hamburger and hot dogs and, and that could be very, very biased yeah. based on another culture that oh, yeah. for you it might even right. for another be part a taco of the burrito. Even right. for another part of the country, it would be different. People right. down south, norms as chitlins and whatever. What would be considered an appropriate behavior okay. that they may not practice in another country that what we would concede as inappropriate? Mm. I'm telling you, this thing is big. If you look at some of your Middle Eastern yeah. countries. Their, their ideal of adulthood is not 18 years old. No, it's in some African countries, the rites of passage into adulthood is 13. Now. Mm -hmm. huh. Being married to a 13-year-old kid in this country would be considered child abuse. Well, no, first of all, it wouldn't happen. Right. <laughs> okay, this is good. But what I'm saying, this is, how, this is how powerful culture is. So who are we? As the American system to judge a system that may be going in another area of the world. We may not find it appropriate where they might find it appropriate. Yeah. For example, what would be a norm in Dedicado under the mission here? All right, service. So, what would be inappropriate behavior? Charles just gave a description of it. Inappropriate behavior where a patient comes to ask you for something. And you're to tell that patient, hey, that's not my job. Or I'm not going to do that. You have to wait till later. Mm -hmm. 
you are not practicing the culture of here that the primary culture here is the word s service period service guys that means not just how clean the place is not just how good the food is not just how we talk to, it's the it encompasses the whole value that i want for dedicado so in the norm in this system here would be service oriented behavior and that even means between each other if i got a job to do i'm not leaving it on you and then i'm gonna say oh, you know i got too busy today and you know whatever without value and you say hey it really did get real busy today i did this and that hey tomorrow man, i'll make sure i'm, I'm more time my time management a little bit better it considers you it tells you why it happened it doesn't blow you off and say, I just couldn't get to it today and leave. And then maybe compromise that relationship because you may have an extroverted type of uh, strong personality where your, your staff member may be introverted and maybe not so assertive or whatever. So now you have a staff member with a resentment who now also fears maybe saying something to you or and or don't want to buck the system. And now instead of you having the, 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 the appropriate ideal of service, it's not just for our patients, service between each other, treating each other with respect. The rawest form of respect that you can show your peer is one to talk to them correctly. And if you make a mistake with your peers, you correct it. And you create cohesiveness and community with each other. And the, the, and the other biggest piece, do your job. When the baton is passed to you in a 4 by 400 meter relay, your teammates want to win. And even if we don't get to the finish line first, we all first because we gave our effort. An additional example would be me on shift and uh, I'm getting ready to get off. And... And I say, uh, hey, Jeff, I didn't get a chance to do that. Jeff says, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Jeff decided not to take care of it. Mm. And then when it comes back, well, who was supposed to do this? David was supposed to do that. <laughs> right? Mm. <laughs> and then without even understanding that your attitudes and the way you interact with others, now here we go with the whole ideal of benefits. I mean, am I interacting with my peers in service to them too, so that I project an attitude that my primary reason to be here, am I helping my patients? And if my attitude is incorrect, and I'm walking around with an attitude that isn't in, it isn't in agreement with my peers, am I helping them or hurting them or what, letting them really see what coping looks like? We're never going to agree with each other all the time. And I say that, there's, there's no such thing as always agreeing. You're not going to. But once you walk in the door, there is a professional expectation. If I hire you on my football team and you're a wide receiver, I say, dude, go. And you're getting 10 million, I know you ain't getting 2 million, but you still got a paycheck coming in. But it may not be what you want or not be it. If it puts an extra, if it puts a, a gallon of milk on your table, look at the idea that it's simply, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing something with my life. So let's take the money part out. Let's just take the responsibility part. The culture we're creating here is service. And if you're not helping each other, if you're not writing the things that need to be written about the patients so that your peers can read it and conceptualize and really understand what you're trying, the picture you're trying to paint, so they're in interaction with it that we have dropped the ball. Don't think you could just write something. This is sometimes comes to people bringing in some old habits. This is a culture here, guys, that the work does get checked. I'm, 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 I'm held to a cause to check the work. Why do you think some people think, man, this guy's always in my face, but I'm really not in your face. <laughs> what would happen is if you were doing the job, you would never see my face. What scares me is not to be able to have the culture of trust, but there's one thing I can't teach anybody here. And that's the ideal of being intentionally, intentionally practicing some integrity in my work. I can't teach you that. Now that's a value that you have to have one, but that without the integrity, there will be no growth. So if you have any ideal of growing in your life and don't try to practice some form of integrity wherever you are, got news for you. 
That's where you'll stay. Here's a, an additional example. If, if the culture I have in my household is that I'm dependent on my phone, that every time she calls, I'm, I'm answering no matter what. If that's the culture I'm operating with, then when I'm in the workplace, I've made, entered into an agreement that I will work for this rate and I will give you this per hour for that rate. That's the implied contract. And every time the phone rings, I have to go to the side. What does that communicate to the client? What does that communicate to the other staff member? And we all have to ask ourselves, how do I want to be seen? So it goes to the microcosm of culture and it brings it into the work. So I understand, so then also value, the dynamics of culture, your values are expressed through how you, first of all, your cultural formation, how you grew up. So you already came in with a baseline, a baseline of values. But if I'm willing to grow and become a cultural competent, I'll also realize that just because I have these values don't mean everyone lives by that same value. Okay, let's take, take a break. I see a lot of you.